welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world-leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence-based. The team at the Research Works podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders past and present, and would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record this podcast each week, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. We recognise their continued connection to this beautiful budja we call home. Welcome back to the Research Works podcast. Yeah, welcome everyone. We're so excited that you can join us again this yes, week. Indeed. And Thank today you. we have a wonderful follow up paper from one of our previous guests yes. who is now officially titled Friend of the Podcast. Yes, I, think. I love come it. Back yep. Yep. More than do. once. <laughs> Dr. Roz Ward. Welcome, Roz. Thank you. Welcome. Back. And joining Roz, we have Dr. Neville Hennessy, who is also a co author on the paper we're discussing today. Welcome, Neville. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Oh, that's oh. really cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's always so wonderful when we can talk about the progression of one person's work, you know, and, and a team of work. Um, it's truly the spirit of collaborative research and sharing, continuing to build and just, you know, just more knowledge about a certain area as well. And this is a great example of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you say, Dana, this paper is no exception. Today, we're going to be talking to Roz and Neville about their article titled Implementation of an Early Communication Intervention for Young Children with Cerebral Palsy Using Single Subject Research Design which was published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine in December 2022. So I think we can mm. say it's hot off the press. Yes, indeed. But before we get into the work, let's tell you a little bit more about our guests today. Uh-huh. We'll start with Neville because um, you're our new guest, Neville. Neville <laughs> Hennessy lectures primarily in the Bachelor of Science Speech Pathology Program at Curtin University in the topics of speech science and acoustic phonetics, psycholinguistics, research methods and statistics. Neville's research interests include dyslexia, psycholinguistics, stuttering, normal and disordered speech and language development, including the relationship between the emergence of speech and language skills in infancy and later language and literacy development, as well as the relationship between speech perception and production. Wow. I know, it's pretty impressive. impressive. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Neville, just so you know, Dana always gives me the hard words to say in the, um, in the well, intro. You've done well. I do, I do indeed. I'm very impressed. <laughs> As you read it, I'm like, oh, she's done so good. <laughs> I don't think I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Rosalind Ward is a senior research fellow at the School of Allied Health at Curtin University. As a speech pathologist, Ros is well known for her work in motor speech interventions, particularly in the area of cerebral palsy. Her work has employed innovative assessment techniques and research designs such as single case experimental design. In addition to this work, which has contributed significantly to the body of evidence for motor speech interventions, Ros has also contributed to the International Clinical Practice Guidelines for Early Intervention in Children with Cerebral Palsy, as well as the large cohort studies investigating early detection for cerebral palsy which I think is pretty oh impressive. My gosh, <laughs> I love both of those bios. It's wonderful. Thank you, Ash. You did very, very well. Thank you. That was I really think good. I think we can declare today another speechy takeover. It is indeed. <laughs> it's happened again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rose and Neville, that's the formal getting to know you. Mm-hmm. And now we like to do a bit of an informal getting to know you. So our icebreaker question for today is, what's the most interesting speech you've heard and why did it stand out to you? It's a tricky question, but we wanted to go with the speech well, thing. I see what you did yeah. there. That was really yeah. good. So I can get the ball rolling if you like. Okay, yeah, go for it. I don't know if it's probably the most interesting speech I've heard, but also um, one of the most wonderful speeches I've heard was mm. the speech my dad gave at my wedding. Oh, wow. And the reason for that is because he has a complete fear of public speaking. This was, you know... On paper, his absolute worst nightmare. He hates talking in front of people. He hates being the centre of attention, but it meant so much to him to write this speech and talk in front of everyone about how proud he was of his family and, you know, us becoming a new family. And it just meant so much to me because of how much effort 
he put into it and yeah. how much he had to overcome to do that. And that, that was, so yeah, cool. so that that for me was the most interesting speech I got to hear. Oh, wow. That's got it. Like it ticks all the boxes really, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like overcoming, there's the courage to do that, but yeah. the love for you to do it. Yeah. And I, I didn't it. cry when I said it, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Worked really hard on that. <laughs> That's why you went first. Yeah. So Get this out of <laughs> Well, shall we go to you, Neville? Do you have one in mind? Uh, well, when you mentioned speeches, I was thinking of uh, the many types of presentations yes, that um, yes. researchers can give. And then I was going through my mind as to which one stood out yeah. to me. And yeah. uh, there was one presentation by um, Daniel Kahneman, who's uh, won the Nobel Prize in the area of oh. economics. And I uh, had the opportunity to see him present. Wow, Pretty amazing. soon after that, he'd won oh, the Nobel gosh, Prize amazing. and he gave a... Uh, an account of of his large body of research and uh, his research uh, along um, with um, Amos Tversky mm-hmm. together, they did some really, um, you know, influential uh, studies of human decision making and judgment that mm. is now sort of impacting lots of areas oh, like economics yes. and so anyway, that just really did that stand out. That would be such a buzz to, to, to mm, hear that. And yeah, yeah, just, wow, that's amazing. Very prestigious so uh, so researcher. Yeah. Yeah. What an opportunity yeah. to get mm. to listen mm. to, to him talk. Such a, a pivotal moment in his career as yeah. well. Amazing. There's nothing quite like the buzz you get from a great keynote yes. presentation yes. or, yes. you know, something like mm. that yes. is there. Yep. Roz, should we go to you? When you first asked that question, I'm like, oh, no, there are so many speeches <laughs> to draw down on. Where do you go? Which one do you choose? <laughs> yeah. And I guess, and then influenced by listening to the speeches that have been remarkable for you both, mm. I reflect on why we're sitting in this room now, mm. how have we arrived at this place, how have I arrived at this space? And I guess yeah. the speeches... I find it difficult to identify just one, but the the content of the speeches are the ones that are inspirational yeah. that then to um, drive you on to make a difference. Yes, so be yes. that from listening to speeches that have talked about how women have um, um, challenged the status quo yeah, and yeah. changed things for, for us as yeah. women through to listening to the mathematician who's made a big difference in the lives, I've forgotten his name right now, um, yeah. of young people who have yeah. then hated maths and then gone on to inspire others. So, so it's, it's a little bit more diverse than one yeah. um, speech, yeah. but the yeah. theme of. Yeah. Yeah. We'll allow that. I like yeah. that. <laughs> well, mine follows really nicely from that in a way because my when I think of a speech, I think of one that was like a – it was very influential, almost confirming for me. It was Dr. Dale Hull. Um, mm. And I heard him speak at Rehab Week 2017 in London. Yeah. And it was just when I had the idea to start up Healthy Strides and I was, you know, just percolating and putting the ideas together. And he was telling a story about how he had basically set up neuroworks with his physiotherapist and he'd sustained a spinal cord injury. And he told mm. about, you know, what had happened through that process and his rehab journey. And then he told this remarkable story about the creation of this amazing, in rehab center in the United States. And I'm sitting there with all this in mind already. And he said, so if you want to start a rehab center, all you need is one passionate physio. And I'm like, it's me. (laughs) (laughs) And I just remember like out of all the features that he picked to be able to carry something out, he picked passion. Mm. And I love that that was the thing that came out because that's where things need to start for them to be authentic. And that's the yeah. energy that you can then, that drives you even when times are hard. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I nearly fell off my chair for that no. one. I skipped out of there and I was bumping to people and I was like, la, 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 <laughs> this is amazing. But it, it changed the course of things for me. So those are the influential speeches that can yeah. change change the course. Yeah. It's like something out of a movie, isn't it? It kind of like is. Like he was speaking to you. Yeah, yep. yeah. I feel like the camera's <laughs> zooming in on me, like da, da, da. <laughs> it was one of those moments. Yeah, yeah I, I needed love a voiceover. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for sharing your your story. Sorry to throw a, a curly icebreaker at you today, but it's a good one though. Yeah, it's very absolutely. Yeah. yeah, well done. That's really good. <laughs> Should we get into it? Let's do it. (laughs) Let's go. Okay. So let's tell you a little bit about this study. 
This study implemented an intervention protocol that was aimed at increasing vocal complexity in three pre-linguistic children with cerebral palsy. So two males starting from 15 months and one female starting from 16 months. This was evaluated using a repeated ABA case series design until the children were aged 36 months of age. Successive blocks targeted more advanced protophone production and speech movement patterns that were individualized for each participant. The data suggests that emerging speech production skills in pre-linguistic infants with CP can be positively influenced through a multimodal intervention focused on capitalizing on early periods of plasticity when language learning is most sensitive. There is so much to unpack here. Let's get started. I got myself one big word there, but I got through it. Well done. That's good. (laughs) Okay. I am, I'm just itching to get into the the meat of this paper, but I feel like we should probably (laughs) take a step back, start with some background. So Ros and Neville, what do we currently know about communication impairment in young children with cerebral palsy? What we know about communication impairment in children with cerebral palsy is that about 60 to 85% of children with CP will have a communication impairment. Mm, Wow. The communication impairment is going to vary in type and it's going to vary in severity. Mm -hmm. We also know that typically the communication impairment is chronic, Mm -hmm. which means that it has the potential to have long-term impact on activity and participation Mm -hmm. from having basic needs met through to forming friendships and potentially educational success and employment. Mm -hmm. That information has been grounded in studies that have been done retrospectively through, um, for example, case audits Ah, and registries and typically aimed at older children. Mm. So you asked about younger children. What do we know about younger children? (laughs) And unfortunately, there's a massive gap in Mm. our knowledge for, for younger children The work of Professor Katie Husted and her team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison are making a huge contribution into our understanding of younger children. Mm. They've been tracking children longitudinally from about two years of age, um, and I believe her data is now beginning to um, address the adolescent um, age span as well. That's how long she's been collecting data. Mm, And she started to profile um, communication impairment and develop growth curves around speech intelligibility. Wow. So then between naught to two years, what do we have? Yeah. <laughs> I think we've made a small contribution in that space. Absolutely. And hopefully yeah. we'll start to see um, more data in the coming years. Yeah. So at the moment we know that it is possible to see mm-hmm. um, deviations from typical vocal development yeah. at about nine months of age based on a small sample size. Yeah. 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 I mean, I find that surprising in a way, given how, you know, the, the focus so much on early intervention and, and mm. our knowledge around that neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. Um, would One of the reasons why maybe the research hasn't been so big in Sarah is because we focus so much on motor, like mm. gross motor, fine motor at this early age, which is typically a lot of the goals when you often, you know, when you're we, we working with families. Is that a reason why? Because that's been so much attention to that area? I believe so. And when we look at the work that's being done in the early intervention space, an amazing work that's being done, it's around diagnosis and identification, which is it's principally a motor impairment. And so then moving forward, it's about dealing with those motor issues Mm -hmm. um, and about survival Mm -hmm. at times as well, Mm -hmm. so mealtime management um, and so the emphasis on communication is not at the forefront. Sure, yeah. And potentially that's based around our knowledge of infants. Um, they are preverbal. Mm, that's yeah. not the word I want to use. They're pre-linguistic. Sure. Yeah. And so we're not expecting communication sure. until they start to talk. And so mm. you kind of think so you can push of, it to the yeah, background sure. yeah. when in fact those early Years, yeah, mm. early, very early days, months, yeah. you're laying down very important foundations. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Which leads really nicely into my sort of next question. Well, look, the last time you were on, we, I, I, for the first time, you know, got taught about canonical and babbling and pre, and we talked a little bit about that in terms of the vocal, um, infant vocalizations. 
Can you just give us a bit of a rundown and just a summary again to refresh our memories? Because I think that's quite important for this, isn't it? Like what is what do we typically see when it comes to mm-hmm. infant vocalisations? Well, in, infants uh, quite quite an early age are um, are learning the, the the sound of the language, and yeah. the, and from uh, within the womb as well, they're starting to pick up as um, aspects of the the rhythmic pattern of the language that they're going to be uh, exposed to, sure. and so that um, they also explore with their their vocal abilities, mm. um, their their own capacities, mm. and that's starting at a very early age. And so, it, what's be, um, what's been observed is that infants um, begin to uh, vocalise in um, um, in ways that reflect the control of, of their production of vowels. Yeah. And then they move on to speech-like articulations. And so these vocal patterns increase in complexity and become more speech-like that match the, the ambient language that they are learning yeah. at that point. Yeah. Mm, um, yeah. And so those changes in their ability and the complexity, they've been referred to as protophones. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, and that can include various types of um, productions of like even raspberries, producing mm-hmm. raspberries that require closure but pushing air through the mouth. Sure. That's important in being able to then formulate uh, syllable production. So mm, that's an yeah. early protophone for later syllable production. Yeah. And then you have the more familiar babbling that you, you hear in infants yeah. Yeah. and same, you know, ba, ba yeah. and da. So the, those sequences of a consonant and a vowel uh, yeah. start to emerge. Yeah. And that's before that they um, produce their first word. So this is all happening six sure. over 10 months of age. Mm. They have a real emergence in this, uh, these early speech patterns. Mm. Yeah. So oh. you can see why that's important, right? Like you, you need to understand what that sort of process is before we even get to saying words. Yeah. You know, I think and that's the... Yeah, yeah. And you need those building blocks. Mm. You know, you need to, to go through that, that sequence of mm. development to get to a point where you are able to form words, is that? Well, that's right. As you start to uh, develop, as an infant starts to develop the capacity to um, communicate with intention, Mm. they draw on those um, articulatory skills Mm. and patterns um, and for their first words. So there's that transition. So they these early vocal patterns are mm. building blocks mm. um, yeah. and it's important that there's opportunity to lay those, mm. bu- you know, to get those building blocks mm. happening and, and um, available for their ongoing language development. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I guess some of it's like it's breath control. Some of it is about coordination. Yes. Um, and yeah. there's, there's so much to coordinate. I mean, you only need to go to the dentist to <laughs> have a feeling and you walk out and you're just like, I, I don't, I can't feel anything. I don't mm. know what's happening. Your words, like yeah. there's so much to coordinate. And mm. when we put on top of that cerebral palsy and you've got movement disorder, sensory, you put all of that into play. I can yeah. see how that process could be really shifted or mm. look quite different. Very and, social mm. as well. So yeah, we sure. know yeah. that yeah. Um, the vocalisations that uh, a baby gives to the people around them influences mm. their behaviour and then so how we True. respond yeah, to those yeah. vocalisations yeah. has an impact on that yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. And I was just thinking as well, you know, you mentioned before, as we think of, you know, cerebral palsy primarily as a, a motor disorder, mm. but you know, speech has such a huge motor component to it. So, it it, you know, it's That's right. If the, if there is that impairment there, that you know, obviously has an influence on yeah, the, skeletal that, muscles. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That right. muscle control, yeah. and I mean, it's obviously you know, language and, and speech is very complex, but that is mm. a component to it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And in fact, the literature is telling us from some of the studies that have been done in older children that the majority of children with cerebral palsy will have some motor involvement in their in their speech, even if it's not frank overt dysarthria, yeah. that there might be subclinical signs associated. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. good to understand that. Yeah. Mm. And thank you for that beautiful mm. overview. Um, now that we understand a little bit more about, you know, I suppose we've set the scene, can you talk to us a little bit about what interventions might be available for young children mm. you know, if, if you do identify that there is you know an issue yeah. there that needs to be addressed in in with a with an early intervention kind of lens yeah. on it what yeah. what is available to support these children I'm going to answer that at, in t- at two levels yeah. firstly what's available for CP specific yes. interventions yeah. and then what's available for 
under twos in populations that maybe are not CP but are, have speech and language difficulties oh, yeah, right, associated yeah, with them. Mm-hmm. So in the CP, <laughs> guess what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got two systematic reviews. Yeah. Um, I think there was one that was done in 2016 by Chawna et al. Uh-huh. And then the more recent um, review that re- you referred to um, earlier at yeah. the start yeah. of this podcast there are no CP-specific interventions mm. for um, speech, language development, communication in the not to 2 age range. Mm. So it's not until much older, which yeah. means that wow. we're missing those critical yeah. periods. Yeah. However, there is some <laughs> literature. A beacon of light. <laughs> <laughs> in the space for younger children who are presenting with speech and language difficulties, mm. Um, Either they're slower to develop or it's associated with other neurodevelopmental, um, um, can I say disorders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Such as autism spectrum disorder. And although they're different, there is a common theme that reoccurs through those supported by literature around early development as well. Mm. And that is core elements of intervention. They need to address the parent-child interaction. We need to be responsive. We need to be goal-directed and there needs to be coaching with caregivers. Sure, yeah. So there's those real active ingredients and those principles that that apply to, to everyone. In that, in that way, yeah, 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 that's really good to know. Yeah. Hmm. So, is that what you sort of mean by in the in this paper? I guess we're starting to go into the paper now, like a multimodal approach. Like, can you explain? Is that what that means? So, yes, yeah, communication is multimodal. Look yeah. at it. Yeah. <laughs> we're all waving our hands yeah. <laughs> to be able to see on our video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's not just vocal. Yeah. It is um, we're using gestures, sure. we're using eye gaze, we're looking mm. at facial features, we're watching facial movements. Mm. We require hearing. Mm. So it's visual, it's auditory, it's sensory, mm. and it's sensory motor. Yeah. 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 And so in terms of multimodal interventions, we do know from um, work of researchers such as Choi, which I referenced yeah. Yeah. in the article, yeah. that if you have... Um, if you are not given the opportunity to practice and experience across each of those modalities, yep. then speech and language development will be constrained. Oh, it's task specific on all levels really, mm. isn't it? Yeah, that's that's really important to actually draw out because I think sometimes uh, we it's really easy just to go down one path, <laughs> right? It's, it's just all about words, but we don't, we don't communicate that way. You know, how many times do people get offended if you write a, a text without enough emojis in it nowadays to kind of go, <laughs> I'm trying to express emotion because there's more to it than yeah. just what's what's said. Yeah. Um, okay, so now shift now to, to the, the actual approach prompt. Mm. Can you talk us through what prompt actually is and what, what's the theoretical framework? What's mm. it based on? Why yeah. do we do it? So PROMPT is an acronym that mm-hmm. stands for Prompts for Restructuring Oral Phonetic Targets. I love PROMPT. And <laughs> I think most people who are familiar with PROMPT mm. know it from the use of tactile kinesthetic input. Mm. Yeah. However, the theoretical is broader than that. It is multidimensional, it is multi-sensory, uh, and it is grounded in dynamic systems theory. Uh-huh. And I know that you're a fan of dynamic <laughs> well, systems theory yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably been yeah. a theoretical approach that has been foundational to rehabilitation within yeah. the motor yeah. sphere. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, so from a communication perspective, you know, how long you've given me just a few minutes, I'm going to try and be really focused here, (laughs) that what we're looking at from that clinical rehabilitation perspective as speech language pathologists is Mm. that we're not grounded within that developmental perspective. Mm. We're looking at growth and development emerging from the interaction between the components within the system that Mm -hmm. you're operating and then the impact of experience and practice on that growth and development as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, for all those uni students out there who are learning dynamic systems theory and don't see, like, don't understand it, that was like the best definition you could probably give of it. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That was brilliant because you, I mean, and when you look at that in practice, it makes so much sense, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it, it makes you sort of look out, it makes you take that step out, I think, yeah. these theories. They make you sort of look at the whole context, which I really, really love. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. So, mm. so bros. Let's just talk now about how this intervention, I suppose, 
was trying to address that gap that we talked about before. How is how does prompt fit into this paper and the questions that you had around? So I guess there's two key elements there, and that is the theoretical framework of dynamic systems theory. Mm -hmm. So you need to look at the components within a system Mm -hmm. and that opportunity for practice and experience Mm -hmm. for new behaviours to develop and emerge. So looking at the components within a system of communication, Mm -hmm. what the individual brings to the table in terms of their physical ability, cognitive linguistic ability Mm -hmm. and social emotional So being able to evaluate what the balance is between each of those um, components. And then in terms of that multi-sensory element, being able to put strategies in place that facilitate Mm. the opportunity to have successful practice and experience to go on to develop really adaptive and functional communication skills Mm. within the daily routine yeah. of the yeah. child and what's important to the child and the family. Yeah. Um, I guess what Prompt offers as well, the second key component yeah. is that mm. given communication is multisensory, there is a use of auditory, visual and tactile kinesthetic mm. input to shape those behaviours. Yeah. And I love it when you talk about all of those, I suppose, pieces of the puzzle that you're trying to to put together it really becomes very individualised for the child that you're working with, doesn't it? That's right. Um, So it does require you as a clinician working with the family to determine what are the strengths are, where there's not the balance that's preventing that integration. Do you need to be focusing more on building that social emotional awareness or understanding of routines or understanding of how communication works? That This vocalisation, for example, is communicative and shaping, shaping that. So it is unique to each individual. Yeah. So fascinating, isn't it? And such, you know, really interesting for you as the clinician getting to work with these families Mm -hmm. to try and piece all of that together, right? And work out where the strengths are, where they need extra support, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. It's such a strengths-based approach. Yes. We we talk about that a lot. And um, so often in developmental, I guess, um, approaches, Traditionally, it's all been about the the fix it. You know, we've been talking about that a Mm. lot on the podcast Mm. lately. It's the, you know, what are the impairments that we need to fix? And that takes us real sort of almost a negative view in terms of how to approach. But we're taking a strength base. What is the child, what are the strengths of the child now and how can we harness that to help them to develop and give them the best opportunity to do what they want to do? Mm. And um, I feel like that's really consistently across all the research now, you know, uh, and our practices. Absolutely. I guess. And what are the strategies Mm. that you could provide the yeah. child and the family yeah. with to yeah. maximise their potential. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. it. It's really great. Absolutely. So the aim of your study was to test the hypothesis that intervention starting before two years of age framed within that prompt approach that we've talked about will improve vocal complexity of children mm. with communication impairment secondary to CP. You used for this study, which I'm really excited about, a single subject experimental methodology, which we know by, you know, a few other names as well, single case experimental designs. Um, This is an incredible piece of work and we're, you know, (laughs) and such a valuable contribution, I think, to the field. Can you talk to us about why you chose this study design specifically for this work? Well, with with the single case design, you're focused on the individual and uh, bringing about change and, and in this case, um, progressing in their development in, in certain areas of mm. interest. Um, and so with that focus on the individual, that really uh, matches uh, the single case approach. Um, and it's it's not just like a case study where you're you're looking and observing and describing what happens, yes. um, but you're you're using more scientific rigor in the methodology in order to demonstrate that the treatment is bringing about the change. And mm. part of the, the the real essence of the single case design in uh, doing that and and having scientific rigor is being able to. Um, 
observe through repeated measurements a, a, a relevant target behaviour, is what we call it, mm. and over time, and you observe that under conditions where there's no intervention initially, and that's mm. referred to as a baseline, mm -hmm. and then you introduce the intervention in a, in a controlled way. So this is where you're seeking to get experimental control yes. by having the intervention in place and continuing to observe that behaviour and uh, looking for change in, in the measure. And um, part of the, um, there are a number of uh, reporting guidelines or guidelines mm. on how to conduct these studies yeah. to mm -hmm. achieve scientific rigour and, and improve the validity of, of the, the results. Um, and that can include being able to replicate the, uh, the changes you're observing. And yes. so we built that into the study. Uh, we had baselines, we had the intervention phase, and then we had a second uh, um, post-intervention phase where we were able to then compare performance before and after. And that's mm. essentially a way of uh, um, estimating the size of the effect mm. um, associated with that treatment or intervention. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to replicate uh, change by introducing the intervention yep. through uh, a series of three blocks yep. of uh, intervention phases, mm -hmm. um, plus also across the three children. And Gosh. so the, together, yeah. those findings lend sort of support that uh, yep. the intervention is being effective. Mm. So that's that's sort of really why the, the design is, is uh, you know, a good one to use. Yeah. Um, and it's really appropriate for uh, uh, areas uh, where the, um, the the client or um, is uh, you know unique in, mm. in, in the term mm. so, so this is a heterogeneous type of yes. um, effect on, yes. on development and yeah. so it's yeah. important to be able to focus on the individual mm. and and demonstrate that the That's intervention right. works for the individual and not just for a lot, an abstract group mean and and mm. uh, that you mm. uh, find in um, clinical trials and yeah. group yes. focused studies yeah. That was such a beautiful explanation of, <laughs> of the, the rationale for why you would yeah. choose a, a single subject or single case experimental design. And I, that was a really important distinction you made, I think, between case studies yeah. and single subject research designs, because I think people who are less familiar with those might use those terms interchangeably, but they're right. really incredibly yeah. different. And single case experimental designs are incredibly detailed, yes. incredibly rigorous. Yeah. You know, it, it's... I think we we saw firsthand, you know, Ros, when you were in the thick of data collection for this paper, how intensive it actually is yeah. to make sure that you have collected that data yep. in a in a way that allows you to to draw conclusions, you know, across yeah. each of those blocks that yep. you are working with these children in. It's actually it's phenomenal. So I mean, yeah. <laughs> for someone who's who's done scares before, anytime you hear about other people do it, yeah. you go, "Oh my goodness, I know, yes. I understand." Yeah. But I guess that the point for a lot of people is you know, sometimes, um, you know, we hear the criticisms mm. of RCTs. We know mm. RCTs are important on this higher level, but yeah. And um, but if you have these very heterogeneous populations, mm. yeah, like really get into the detail because it gives you time which I feel like sometimes with RCT you have these set times, you know, da, 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 as in mm -hmm. one, two, three, if you can see on the video. <laughs> yeah. And whereas this time you actually have graphs, you can actually see visually where things happen and mm. that in itself is a great way of analysing the data, isn't it? Yeah. Never and I were yeah. 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 talking yeah. earlier yeah. before this um, presentation and my pet hate is the systematic reviews that put the, the RCT, Randomised mm. Control yeah. Trial, at the top of the pyramid yeah. Yeah. and then report SCEDS as low levels oh. of evidence and don't acknowledge the role That's that right. they play yeah. and don't present to the reader because these systematic reviews are supposed to be for clinicians to That's make right. a determination yeah. around uh, which treatment to select mm. is don't acknowledge that actually if you haven't done research in this space before, you need to develop the protocol yes. and you need to see how participants respond. Yeah. Yep. And it does give you information that um, lets you know when the yeah. participant is responding, how long it took, yep. Yep. Um, what dosage um, response yes. that you got. Right. And so I'd really like to see systematic reviews acknowledge that Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, rather than the level. Yeah. yeah, 
And I guess what's really unique about how you've reported in this as well, which you know, really drew my attention to it was the the procedural fidelity like you don't mm. often this was really unique and I know we've yeah. spoken about fidelity many times before uh-huh. I think every time we do talk it's like what about the fidelity <laughs> and you know that's really important so can you just tell us what you did uh, to report on the fidelity because I think that's part of this process yeah so what we did and you noted it 50%. We went through 50% of the intervention <laughs> mm-hmm. sessions and coded. Mm-hmm. We identified what the active ingredients were mm-hmm. and coded whether they were present, yes or no, mm-hmm. and to what frequency. Mm-hmm. So that when we were interpreting the graphs, if we had a high level of response or a low level, if there was variability in the graphs, yeah. Yeah. we could determine whether the variability was associated with the dosage of Uh that session uh or whether it was around other um, potential reasons such as the child on the day having a bad day or other reasons which potentially we can't actually determine but we could actually look at that level of dosage. Did we do, not only did we deliver the intervention as intended but was it at the dosage that was intended? So critical. So important. Yeah. I think because we don't report on that, how do we replicate it, right? So, yeah. you know, even if you were to look at it, I mean, it's not possible, or well, maybe it could be, it would just be pretty painful, but in a big <laughs> RCT, you couldn't do that, you know, into that level of detail sometimes. And I think that that part, you take just a small sample out, whereas here you looked at such a big sample and you mm-hmm. know what the intervention is. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was and impressive. it becomes so translatable to oh, clinical practice yes. as mm, well. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's another real plus yeah. about single subject yeah. Yeah. types of research. Yeah. The yeah. translation to yeah. reduces that gap. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and mm. you know, just on that note, RCTs obviously have a you know a very important role to play in establishing the evidence. That's right. When we yeah, talk yeah. about the hierarchy of evidence, you know, RCTs yeah. are are up there, but often they have to be they play out in such a vacuum and you have to control for so many different things. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. type of experimental design is, like you say, Noel, it's much more authentic to how Mm -hmm. you would operate day to day as a clinician and the the kinds of things that you'd be looking at Mm -hmm. as a clinician who is delivering this type of intervention with and for this family. Yeah. You know, it's a real window really into human. how. Yeah, 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 really human. Yeah, <laughs> feels Which I really like much more. I don't. I don't want to say authentic, but it it feels well. It's, I suppose it feels more authentic to clinical practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So before we go into the results, it's probably really important to know what you actually measured, <laughs> so we can talk about. Oh that. yes, so, yes. Do <laughs> we go there? Because I'm I'm busting to talk about the results, but let's let's take that step back for a second. What's the target behaviour? And I know that you had probes as well, so you can just mm. talk us through what did you actually measure what was that what was that intensive data collection what did that what was it yeah so <laughs> what we've reported in this paper uh-huh. and what you see on the graphs was the reporting on the development of their vocalizations right so following um, an assessment period using standardized measures uh-huh. and then extracting the speech and coding the protophone, so the types of vocalisations that they were using, Mm. we then looked at the um, complexity of that protophone and how we would like to increase the protophone. So we did that embedded within daily routine, so Mm. at what was important to the family. So, Mm. for example, if it was a a nappy change time, what protophone might be able to fit with that routine. If it was a, a play routine and then enjoyed playing with particular types of toys, what would be vocabulary yeah. that would be associated with that. So we selected the vocabulary uh-huh. and then we selected what we expected they would be able to produce in terms of the protophone. Sure. And then as we progress through the therapy blocks, we would review again pre-baseline, mm. determine whether they were ready to go up to the next level of complexity in that right. pro- protophone next, yeah. yes or no, yeah. to then uh, wanting to arrive at being able to use single words. Right. So I Quite do want to make clear yeah. too that we acknowledge that some children are going to be nonverbal communicators. Yeah. It's not going to be their primary form mm. yeah. of communication. So we also had other communication supports in place that we mm. were focused on at the same time, yeah. but it's not the focus 
of this sure. and it really yeah. was around that opportunity for vocal play yes. because of the power that has on later language learning Absolutely. and potentially access to AAC systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. That's yeah. really important. Yep, yeah. that's really good. Okay, so time to go into results. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about the results in terms of the the blocks that you went through with your participants. Mm. So that first block, which was around building the social ret- routine and enriching the environment. Talk to us about the results you had throughout that block. Mm. So, yes, that first block very much um, focused on building the social routine and that script around when we're doing this sort of activity, mm. these are the turns that we take, this is the interaction between yeah, the caregiver okay. and, and the parent, that real transactional nature mm. yeah. of the interaction. And so the strategies were really focused around building that. So they were exposed to yeah, the vocabulary. Sure. So yeah. we predicted that we would see a little bit of growth, yeah, yeah. but because it was really about laying down and having the attention directed at the routine mm. and the expectations mm. around that mm. and the transactional nature of the interaction, yeah. we didn't expect to see a huge change yeah. in their vocal behaviours in terms of slope and level. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And and was that the case? Is that? And that yeah. was the case. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so... I think that's probably important to kind of tease out a bit for Mm. clinicians. Talk to us about, you know, how important that block, I suppose, is when you are setting up, you know, to deliver this kind of intervention with children. Mm. So we, as you know, started... Some of these babies have been tracked from six months yeah. of age. So the intervention started in this motor speech space at mm. 15 months. They'd gone through a transactional intervention at 12 months of age yeah. so that the families actually understood following a child's lead, yeah. um, uh, the strategies around responsiveness. Mm. That's sort of Hannon, I that, guess. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Correct, yeah. Hannon. And then we moved into the home and really structured it around the home mm. um, routine and what was important to the family. Mm. In terms of importance, that's our highest level of evidence at the moment yeah. is right. that in terms of building speech and language development that we yeah. need to have that transactional positive yeah. um, interaction. Yeah. If you've got a baby who's vocalising at a level of pain or, or grizzling because mm. they're not quite making the sounds and those vocalisations are not being responded to, then potentially those um, vocalisations are going to be shut down sure. yeah. because yeah. there's not that responsiveness to it. Yeah. 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 And, and we you don't do get know. the practice. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's setting up that environment. We talk a lot about that enriched environment. What does mm. it look like? Well, this is probably part of it, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Setting the scene, people in, you know, important people in the child's world understanding and supporting and having some strategies in place, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, that's right. Which I feel like anyone could do, you know, as in like we can teach anyone to do that. So mm. whilst you might be waiting, because we know there's wait lists, mm. right? Mm. So whilst there's wait lists, we could still be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, not a lot of resources. And uh, I think, yeah. you know, in terms of transdisciplinary, plary, I'll try that again, <laughs> edit that ed, <laughs> transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or whatever, yeah. when you're working together as yeah. a team and you've got one family with so many demands, yeah. this is something that can be embedded when, you know, when you're stepping on a treadmill yeah, yeah, or right. when you're doing a nappy changing yeah. routine. It yeah. doesn't have to be. Yep. Yeah. Speech time. Yeah. yeah. Necessarily. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and the takeaway I yeah. had as well, you know, rightly or wrongly, is that while you might not be seeing huge changes or any changes really in that initial initial foundational period, it's still a really critical period to then build on in the subsequent blocks that you go through mm. with that child, isn't it? So Absolutely. don't pie the building blocks. Yeah, yep. yeah. And mm. it's and it's a slow gradual process, isn't That's it? That's it. And it is that raised awareness around what is the role that these vocalisations that this little person is giving, yeah. what is the role of these um, vocalisations, what is being communicated mm. to then respond yeah. to those vocalisations. So oh, I can hear you're in pain, yeah. you're yeah, uncomfortable. Sure. Oh, yep. you're telling me. Yep. It's yep. tuning in, yep. isn't it? It's just yep. being aware, yep. tuning in, yep. hearing yep. it, acknowledging it and actually s- realizing it's important mm. and yes. there's a process to it. Yeah. And that you hear them. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so that's block one. Yep. Tell us about block two and three. Yes. <laughs> Broadly, but yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> so that I'm excited. Block two and three is where we moved into the motor speech space more directly. Yes. Mm. So the foundations were laid down yeah. and we used the tactile kinesthetic input to then shape the vocalisations to increase the complexity of the vocalisations. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so we also had language around what sounds that they were making, how to make those sounds and supporting them with the production mm. of those sounds. Mm. Yeah. What was the frequency of the intervention, I suppose, through this? I don't think we've covered that part yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, home visits once a week. Home visits mm-hmm. once a week, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the therapy was structured. It was about 45 minutes uh-huh. um, with 30 minutes hands-on with the child mm-hmm. and the rest of the time spent with the family, family yeah. talking about how the previous week went, mm-hmm. what was going to be mm-hmm. the focus of the next week. Yeah. Plus yeah. you also have to make allowances for collecting, mm-hmm. the, doing the probes. Yes. And, yes. Uh, so we can measure yeah. um, and track change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So how many weeks was that in total for the for block two for the intervention? So the, the intervention blocks were 10 weeks. 10 weeks. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So... Ten That's weeks of home so visits, yeah. and then, as Neville said, staying on to <laughs> collect the data yeah. 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 afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So we were there sure. longer than that. The yeah. probes got easier as time went by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, what did you find uh, as a result of these? Intensive. Yeah. Can you remember all the results? Because there are a lot of results with effect <laughs> sizes and so on. But basically oh, what know. we saw <laughs> okay. is that we had that increased progression mm. in um, skill development. Yeah. So for, and it d- depended again, that's why it was nice, single subject um, design, mm. looking at the individual participants, because we also had children who had spastic CP and yeah. ataxic CP. Yeah. Right. Yep. And yep. so we could see that... Um, that third block was really necessary mm, yeah. um, to f- – the second block was really like, okay, I'm moving into – I'm having control, I'm uh-huh. starting to develop control. Uh-huh, yeah. Third block, yeah. oh, it's it's being laid down now, yeah. whereas the other children was like that really progressive in, increase. I think for one of the participants, if we'd stopped at block two, yeah. Yeah, we would not have got the progression that wow. we would have liked. Yeah. yeah. So, That's yeah. important information, isn't it? It's yeah. when you're planning, when you're actually, you know, within the context of any any family wanting to sit down with their therapist to sort of plan, okay, what does our year look like? Yeah. Because <laughs> they're busy lives. You're talking about young people, busy lives, probably sleep as a factor, mm-hmm. a lot of things to think about, probably nutrition as yeah. well, a lot of appointments. So what does it look like? Well, I think it's it's good and fair to say that sometimes some kids might take this amount of time, but others it might take that 20 weeks, might take a longer period of time. But it's important to, to, to know that so you can plan for it, right? And I think that's what single subject design gives you again, isn't yes. it? With that post-treatment phase, yeah. you can yeah. see whether they were maintaining yes or no yeah. or whether they were continuing to develop skills. So I'm a firm supporter of breaks from intervention, yes. planned breaks from intervention for consolidation yes. and just being yeah. Yeah. a family. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, that's... and being able to monitor through measurement. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> taking measurements that uh, allow you to to gather information about how the development is progressing is very important. Oh, yeah. I'm 100%. Mm-hmm. I feel like we just spoke about that before. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as I was, yeah. I was showing Roz around, yeah. I was like, you know, we need to make sure, because it's so easy to make assumptions mm. based on clinical experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that is valuable. Absolutely, it is valuable. But remembering that if we keep talking about each person being so individual, well, how do we make that decision for that person mm. rather than make an assumption, measure and make your recommendations based on that? And yeah. the brilliant thing about single case designs is you can measure for things that are very individual, you know, at mm. least have that to track them. Yeah. And yeah. But yeah. breaks, we we love that. We've been hearing that a lot lately. We have. We? Yeah. It's very mm. consistent with what we talked about with Andrew previously <laughs> yeah. and you know that consolidation phase of learning is yeah. is critical and you know when you when you are engaged in blocks of really intensive therapy and you yeah. do that on an ongoing basis there isn't really that chance to consolidate all the things that you're right. learning That's particularly right. for those really young 
plastic brain. That's right. Yeah. And I think we move in and out of the priorities with the families right. as well. So yeah. I know one of the little yep. people in our study, we did have that intensest focus on yep. vocal productions and that intention behind communication. Mm-hmm. And then a, a, a long period on being successful with AAC and yeah. then being set up yeah. to go into the educational setting and then coming back into the vocal mm-hmm. development again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so vital. So I guess what does this mean for clinicians? Yeah. Like the results that you have gained from this amazing study, what does this what can clinicians take away from this? Get in early. Get in yeah. early. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Capitalize on that yep. neuroplasticity and those pathways that are being laid down mm-hmm. right from the get-go mm-hmm. very yeah. early. Work with your team mm-hmm. um, to have really functional, goal-directed intervention yeah. that includes laying the foundations for vocal development for, for later yeah. success with communication yeah. and have fun. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, that's that's a that's really, really vital. And I think that's that's an important piece of it all, isn't it? Yeah. To, to go fun is actually part of it. Because that's life. And kids should be having fun. It's one of the F words. It's one of the F words. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we're really consistent with yeah. the messaging here now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a way the study is exploratory. Um mm. and it's really the the first study that that I uh, am aware of mm. that has demonstrated that you can get in at that younger age mm. and bring about some change mm. or improvement yeah. in those vocalisations. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, this mm-hmm. is an early stage of the research and um, we would be interested in going further to to look at longer-term benefits of that change. But yeah. just uh, being able to demonstrate that you can get in there yeah. um, through a, an intervention of that type to yeah. to increase the complexity of vocalisations in, right. yeah. in a therapeutic way is yeah. um, is a, a, what the, 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 the research is, uh, is what's quite unique about it. I yeah. Think. yeah, that's wonderful. It's such an exciting space to, to be working in. And, you know, I know for both of you this has been a lot of work, but I think, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you would say it's been, you know, rewarding work and you've made such an incredible contribution to this field that is, you know, crying out for more evidence in this space. So, you know, I I thoroughly enjoyed reading this paper and (laughs) yeah, I'm looking forward to, to what comes next. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've got you know, where to from here? What, where, where's this work taking you? What, or the other things that you've got going on? Where, where to next? We've got a number of papers in semi-prepared state Ooh, nice. <laughs> That's very with a data set that we've um, continuing to um, analyse. Yeah. So watch this space for those papers, hopefully in the next 12 months. Fabulous. And then really the intention is um, getting more grants to yeah, yeah. actually scale up, looking at um, the outcome measures as well, ways no, no. that are easier to mm. collect the data than the intensiveness yeah. of the um, analysis that was required, which <laughs> Neville, <laughs> you're at, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe. But, yeah. yeah, easier ways to actually extract yeah. Yeah. and analyse the protophones would be. Yeah is what we're looking at as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's that real translation into clinical practice, mm. isn't it? Making yes. it accessible for mm. clinicians to to pick up and use these assessments. Yeah. In, yeah. Yep. That's part Absolutely. Of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you so much. There was, I feel like I learned so much in that process. I feel like I yeah. said this about every podcast, but when I learn so much more about this, I just, I know that we can put this into practice Mm. because I think the main message you put out there is something so tangible and and, and we can do it. And I'm so, I feel so inspired by that. So thank you so much for taking the time out to to speak with us about this and sharing your knowledge. Um, And remember to all of our listeners out there, if you want, you know, links to where you can find the paper, our show notes, head to our website, researchworks.net. And there's a a link there to the CPD form as well. If you want to keep this part of a record of your PD requirements. Yeah. It's all there. It's all there. It's all there, all there. And... You know, Ros and Neville are going to be very busy, so it sounds like they need a regular segment on the show to talk about all these papers. I know, I know. (laughs) Thank you very much for your interest in having us today. Yes, thank you. But we're incredibly grateful for your time today. So thank you both for all of your knowledge and for being, you know, willing to to share that with us and all of the listeners. So generously too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us today because it's through 
events like this, yeah. that the information gets out there. Oh, so thank it's a you. pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Well, to all of our listeners, we'll talk to you all again next time. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye. Bye.